Hey everybody, it's Midwest Comic Man, and welcome to Inside the Covers, Episode 2. Um, today we're going to be doing Planet Comics number 2 from Fiction House. Um, I already kind of explained Fiction House in Episode 1, so let's get right into the issue. We start with a great cover of a hideous alien monster menacing some young lass as her male companion tries to rescue her. It's suspected but not confirmed that this cover was done by Wally Wood. In any case, it kind of typifies what would become the standard for Fiction House on their covers. We open it up, and in the uh, inside front cover we have an ad offering photos from the New World War, which wasn't yet called World War II. All you had to do was cut up the cover of your comics. Gotta wonder how many comics covers got clipped for these. Now we get our first story, which is Planet Payson. We start with Professor Sandow's observatory several miles above sea level. They notice some strange flashes in the clouds. So he sends Planet Payson and his companion Roland up to investigate. The next page, they discover a castle on the cloud and land on the cloud to investigate. Gotta wonder how that works. But... They suspect the castle is empty, and they're approaching the castle when two hawkmen dive down at them. Flash Gordon, eat your heart out. The next page, the hawkmen tell the earthmen that they're going to take them to their master, who of course is the guy with the coolest mustache and beard in the clouds. I miss my calling. He tells them the sparks in the clouds are due to the war between the clouds, and asks them to help to end the war, as it seems they have a pretty space spiffy spaceship themselves. In the next page, the Hawk Commander shows off his rockets to Payson. Meanwhile, on another cloud, the enemy commander orders his men to attack the Hawkman castle. We cut back to Payson, taking off with a group of rockets from the Hawkman castle. On the next page, the enemy rockets also take off, headed to attack the Hawkman castle. Payson notices the rockets and points them out to Roland. They head into attack, and they are clearly excited about finally getting to see some action. On the next page, in a fury of sparks and flashes, the enemy forces are decimated. Payson plans to go after the enemy leader, who is called Buzzlark for most of the story, or Buzzark a couple times, depending on where on the page you are. Clearly editing wasn't what it is now. Roland calls him mad for going after the leader, but Payson is unfazed. He sneaks through the clouds to the enemy castle. As they enter the castle, a one-man tank attacks the Earthmen. Kind of looks like a toy to me, but who am I? Payson and Roland quickly dispatch it with blasts from their ray guns. They burst into Buzzlark's chambers and start blasting his men in the face. On the next page, however, they're quickly overpowered and they're placed in electro tubes to be dissolved. Just as Buzzlark is pulling the handle to cause their certain doom, he's blasted from behind by the arriving Hawkman leader. Immediately his men surrender and Payson says, Okay, great, and he just heads back to Earth. I don't know if he showed up in any future issues. This one was kind of anticlimactic. Next, we have The Adventures on Mars of Flint Baker, written by the totally not made up named Star Gaza. The splash page indicates that Flint, Mimi, and his two former prisoner aides are planning to return to Earth after their Issue 1 adventures. On the next page, Princess Vega rushes in, and she begs Flint not to leave yet as Mars still needs them. She explains a dreaded monster will appear soon to steal some victims. Flint pledges that he will fight the beast, and just in time as the beast rushes into the city. On the next page, the four-armed beast grabs terrified Martians before taking off. Vega says this is only the beginning, as the monster always comes three times. Flint tells the girls to stay there while the boys take care of business. This is still 1940, after all. On the next page, they head to their spaceship with Flint complaining that they're moving at a sluggish 10 miles per minute. I wish I had a car that went 600 miles an hour. As they get to the ship, the monster returns and immediately grabs Mimi and Vega. 
because that makes the story more interesting. Flint and his men head straight at the monster in their ship. On the next page, they are piloting the ship straight at the monster's face, and Flint calls it their only chance. The ship powers right into the mouth of the creature before blasting out of the back of the monster's skull. Mortally wounded, the beast starts staggering back to its pit, with Flint in hot pursuit. On the next page, Flint lands, and the men grab what to me appear to be rocket-powered pogo sticks. They begin to fi investigate, but only find bones of past victims. But suddenly, they hear cries for help from a nearby mountaintop. On the next page, using the pogo sticks, and totally not looking ridiculous in the process, they get to the top of the mountain and find the noise coming from a fissure in the rock. They use their ray guns to widen the fissure, creating a cavern that they enter. The next page, the men find the monster. He's lying dead in a pool of his own blood, with Mimi and Vega in a death grip, with scores of terrified Martian captives in the cave. Flint and the men pry apart the creature's hand to rescue the girls, when suddenly a loud cry of stop is heard. The next page, a shot rings out, hitting one of the men, and an angry Martian with a giant head says the Earthman will pay for killing his masterpiece. He says he's all-powerful and tells the Earthlings to approach. Flint decides that they should obey. On the next page, the Martian shows them a new monster he's creating to the horror of the captives and tells them they will all become part of the monster. In fact, he's going to mold each of them into a finger for the monster. Next page, the Martian grabs the wounded Parks and puts him into a mold. As he prepares to power it on, Flint whirls with his ray gun and destroys the machine, but the Martian is unharmed and calls Flint a fool. On the next page, the fiend threatens to destroy the women if Flint makes another move. The men decide they must think of Mimi and the princess. But these girls are no victims. While looking at Flint, they rush up and pummel the the fiend, with Mimi grabbing his gun. On the next page, Flint dives into the melee so he can be the rescuer and fights with the desperate Martian. The Martian breaks free and lifts a boulder larger than him to hurl at the humans. On the next page, Flint uses his ray gun again, disintegrating the boulder, but again the creature is unharmed. So Flint runs up and gives him an old-fashioned beatdown. They take the stunned creature and strap him into his own machine. They turn it on and it explodes, blasting its creator into atoms. On the last page of this story, Vega again thanks Flint for saving the Martian people. Flint pledges to come back in the future, but they must return home. As we close this tale, Flint and Mimi gaze at Mother Earth, happy to hopefully be returning home. The next one is a real mouthful of a title. Tiger Heart of Crossbone Castle on the planet Saturn in the dashing, slashing adventure of the great Solonar Diamond. We find out the Solonar Diamond was the largest diamond ever known, causing lawlessness, lawlessness in the dark ages of Saturn. Tiger Heart is trying to recover the diamond as it's been stolen, because Turk the Terrible has seized the queen and pledges to behead her if it isn't returned. He spots some suspicious men and takes chase. The next page, Tiger and his horse dive into the river and trap the men on a specially designed bridge. The thieves' companions attack Tiger, but Tiger is fighting for the queen and cannot be stopped. Him and his horse decimate the men. The next page, Tiger brings the men to his castle, where he orders the men to take off their clothes. Wait, what? He doesn't find the diamond, so he suspends the two leaders over a pit of Tiger's and they give up the location of the diamond. Tiger finds it in the mane of their large horse, so he heads to the fortress of Turk the Terrible. On the next page, he reaches the castle of Turk the Terrible, and Tiger finds out that he's, well, terrible, and he wants the stone without giving up the queen. Tiger fights off his men, rips the bars out of the queen's cell, and jumps to safety only to be attacked by the dastardly Talon, one of Turk's men, even though he kind of looks like something else. The next page, Tiger quickly dispatches Talon. He scolds him for murdering a cripple in the process. 
He leaps with the queen into the moat and gets her on his horse as he goes to settle with Turk. Turk approaches with his men as Tiger shatters the diamond into a thousand pieces, ending the tale. And then with the next one, we get our favorite, the unfortunately named Spurt Hammond once again. Apparently in the year 40,000, and something called radio, radiatronite powers all of America's industries from one location. It can only be mined from Venus. But as the delivery date for the next piece of ore approaches, there's no word from Venus. So Spurt is sent to investigate. On Venus, Prince Kangis of Mars is threatening Queen Amora of Venus, wanting the radiatronite. Spurt bursts into a meeting as the prince delivers his ultimatum. Spurt says, I'll answer this guy. Grabs him by the beard. And he says, get out, man. This crystal belongs to the good old USA. On the next page, as they're loading the crystal onto Spurt's ship, the Martian leader prepares for war with peaceful Venus. The Venusian queen is kind of worried, but Spurt pledges to return with aid, and America declares war on Mars. An armada of warships is launched. On the next page, the Martian armada approaches Venus, led by a huge flagship. But suddenly, the American ships arrive and split the Martian armada in half. On the next page, Spurt, realizing that the smaller American ships can't go on trying to beat these huge Martian ships, comes up with a plan to end the battle against the massive Mar Martian ships and he even refers to himself as Spurt, my boy. Hidden in a cluster of asteroids, he attaches his ship to the Martian flagship with magnetic anchors and boards the ship. On the next page, Spurt takes out a sentry and steals his cloak as a, as a disguise. He uses this to bluff his way into the control room as a messenger. He secures the door behind him and jumps into action, laying the smacketh down. On the next page, the guards try to beat down the door, but Spurt has taken the ship. The Martian fleet flees as Spurt flies to Venus with his hostages. Spurt informs the Queen as long as he has these hostages, she'll be safe. The Queen thanks Spurt as we get the promises of more adventures the next issue. On the next page, we have a text story. The Earth Queen's Last Refuge. The last Earthlings, including the Queen of Earth, are fleeing some dastardly Betelgeusians who want to exterminate the human race. Betrayed by one of their own, they are being overtaken in space, and it looks pretty grim. Flip the page, and as the enemy closes in, the commander has a revelation. He gives full power to the engines, and the ship starts to shudder. The sound of an approaching comet could be heard. The spaceship narrowly avoids doom, but the enemy is destroyed. The Earthlings live on. We also have an ad where you can sell magazines in your neighborhood to get a pretty spiffy bike. Next up, we have Buzz Crandall of the Space Patrol. We open with Buzz at the bottom of the Neptunian seas, protecting Sandra Corrin and her father, the scientist from the previous issue, as they retreat from crab creatures. The crabmen are too many and they are captured. We find the crabmen were sent by a scientist who controls them from a misty island as he searches for ways to control the human mind. He has an entire city which is enshrouded in mist that he creates with a machine. In the next page, the crabmen bring the captives to the scientist. Buzz calls the scientist a crackpot and attacks the closest guard. But as he does so, the scientist moves his finger to the pointer on a dial by his side. On the next page, this causes the crab man to lift Buzz and smash him into the floor, dazing him. Using the control dials, the scientist has the crab man put the humans in specimen jars and rolled away. Buzz, still da dazed, tries to break out of his jar in vain as they are wheeled into a laboratory. The next page, we're inside the laboratory, and the deformed scientist saps, straps Sandra to a wheel for an experiment. Buzz lunges toward the scientist with the, her father, close behind. The father, however, is swatted aside by a crab man. On the next page, Buzz, however, is able to tear the control box away from the scientist, taking control of the crab man. 
He forces them to he hurl the scientist off the roof of his lab and then free his friends. As we close, Buzz and his friends leave, with the creatures helpless with no one controlling them. And we are promised more Buzz Crandall in the next issue. Next up is Captain Nelson Cole of the Space Force. We open with Cole being tasked to take a fleet to planet Zog in the uncharted space area ZX. Sounds menacing. In the next page, it's explained that Cole was chosen because he is the best space explorer for this dangerous mission. Cole accepts and he immediately launches a space fleet from Dwight Field near Washington, D.C. The next page, once out of the gravitational pull of the Earth, they put the pedal to the metal. But Cole warns his men they're in danger from here on. Suddenly, the scourge of interplanetary travel, a shooting star, bears down on the fleet. We flip the page and see the squad break formation. But oh no, two of the ships are too slow. Ships 7X and 8X are destroyed. Apparently Cole has no time for this. Offering a brief, well, those were the new guys. We gotta continue on. So on the next page, the squadron proceeds, entering Zone 10, known as the Last Outpost. Cole's eyes harden as he looks at his TV screen. He calls us his assistant over to show him what he sees. We find out on the next page that ahead of them is a field of radium asteroids. Instant death to anything within a thousand miles. The ships cannot stop in time, so Cole orders a radical turn to skim the rays from the asteroids, narrowly avoiding them. But on the next page, we find out that the move leaves them open to attack from hidden space raiders. Outnumbered greatly, the ships fight valiantly, but soon only Cole's ship remains. And are surrounded and the raiders prepare to board. Next page, the raiders bring Cole to planet Zog. He says, hey, this is where I was coming anyway. They take him to a long hall, and a man says, Hey, you're just in time. We're in trouble. Monsters ruling us and exacting tribute. Maybe it's just me, but I think destroying all the ships and capturing the people you want to help you is kind of counterproductive. The next page, the man continues and tells Cole only one man can save them. He must wear a cape and wield a magic whip to infiltrate the city. And with that, Cole is now Toro. Apparently Cole didn't have as much problem with this whole killing all my friends thing as I did. So on the next page, Cole enters the city of Zog, a fantastic city in a land of magic. But just as he arrives, a two-headed giant attacks the city, crushing the gate under his heavy blows. The next page, Cole jumps down from a high tower right in front of the giant and orders him to leave. The giant bursts into laughter as the townspeople gaze in wonder at Cole and his powers. Cole cuts down a tree with one swipe of the whip to show his powers to the giant. On the next page, this has the desired effect. The giant flees in terror. Cole explains to the people that he is Toro and will now trail the monster to its lair to recover the treasure. He explains all his powers to him and leaps away, jumping into the giant's bag to hitch a ride to the castle unbeknownst to the giant. The next page, the giant returns to the castle, and Cole slips out of the sack. As the giant sits at the table preparing for his meal, Cole jumps up and orders him to return the treasure. The giant grabs his club, but Cole quickly cuts it in half with his whip. On the next page, the giant produces the treasure, but just as Cole is about to recover it, the giant's wife throws a giant thimble hitting Cole upside the head and allowing the giant to grab the whip. He starts flailing about wildly trying to hit Cole, who leaps on the wife's shoulder, causing the giant to swing wildly and cut off her head. On the next page, Cole recovers the whip which the giant dropped in despair, but the giant turns on Cole, ready to destroy him as the cause of his wife's death. But Cole jumps up and severs both heads of the giant with one stroke. He frees the men and returns the treasure. We close with Cole heading back to Earth and the promise of further adventures. Our last story this issue is Oro, Lord of Jupiter. Oro is giving a banquet for the poverty-stricken when a white woman arrives. Shocked, 
Oro discovers another Earthling on Jupiter, who warns him he must flee immediately. The next page, the woman warns that Agra, her captor and the murderer of her parents, is coming to kill Oro to prove that he is the strongest on Jupiter. Oro says, I am going to go towards this Agra, not away, as the woman tries to dissuade him with tales of Agra's strength. The next page, Oro says he will free the woman from Agra, but suddenly a gorilla escapes. The beast sinks its teeth into Oro's arm, tearing flesh. Oro disengages and crushes the gorilla's skull, but his arm is gravely injured. On the next page, he says, my arm will be indisposed for weeks. But at that very moment, Agra arrives with an army demanding entrance. Oro says, let them into the great hall. Agra threatens to kill Ava for warning Oro, but Oro says Agra will have to kill him first. On the next page, Agra says he's going to break Oro in half. Oro puts his wounded arm behind his back and meets Agra in the middle of the floor. Agra grabs Oro by the throat, ready to rip out his, his neck, and causing his army to howl in wild delight. But on the next page, Oro sends a mighty blow into Agra's stomach, breaking the hold. With great strength, Oro lifts him up and hurls him into his own men. And we find out that Agra is dead, killed by a single blow to the stomach. Oro calls it a just end and orders Agra's men to clear out. Oro tells Ava his palace is now her home. We close with promises of the next adventure, the Dragon God, in issue 3 of Planet Comics. And then we close as usual on the inside back cover with an ad for the big three of Fiction House. It's interesting to note that comics were not weekly, coming out on one day only. For example, Fiction House appears to have titles coming out every five days. And then, on the back cover, we have another ad for basically anything under the sun. Some highlights include a diving submarine, a mounted police suit, a marriage license, and as always, a live chameleon. Thanks for watching everyone. If you enjoyed this video, please smash that like button and sub me up. I've put my website for my cleaning and pressing business in the description below. It's still a work in progress because I've been spending so much time doing videos, but I hope to update it soon. If you need any info or have any questions, my email address can be found on the website. The next episode of Creator Spotlight will highlight Joe Kubert and you don't want to miss that one. Stay tuned for that later this week. And for the, I will likely do Planet Comics number three for the next Inside the Covers. But if you have any requests for future episodes, drop them in the comments below. As always, make sure you tune in for Comic Core on Friday nights and for Blaster Stash It on Sunday nights. Until next time, this is Midwest Comic Man, coming at you from the funny pages.